Well, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Very nice to um, see you all. As you'll see, we have um, an intermittent projector, I think it's called. Um, and uh, I'm sure that everything has been done to rectify the fault, including a wire trailing directly from the projector, which some of you can see hanging down there, going to the um, projection room at the back. But I'm sure that it does work. It just is that it switches on and off. So we'll see how, um, we, see how we, we get on with the, with the technical problems. Um, I'd also like to say that my... Um, my extremely nice publisher um, has turned up this evening with a pile of really beautiful books. Um, <laughs> and when I finish speaking, I'm going to dash out of this top secret back door there, and I'm going to sit at the table, and I'll be able to sign a book for you if you'd like. I'm sure most of you have got one, but um, for those of you who don't have a copy of my History of English Architecture uh, delivered in this very room over a period of four years originally, um, you will, um, I'm sure, um, enjoy the opportunity to buy one this evening. Well, um, tonight uh, we are continuing with the second of my lectures about um, royal building, royal residential building um, in England. And um, last time I described how uh, monarchs, how sovereigns moved from living in a conglomeration of individual structures linked together with pentases to living in something that I think today we would recognize as a royal palace. And the um, intermittent uh, picture on the screen there um, is what I ended with last week, uh, last time, uh, which is uh, Windsor Castle, uh, the extraordinary building constructed by uh, King Edward III, um, a building of um, extraordinary coherence, um, one that uh, you can see um, here in its full context, this is, of course, uh, a 17th century view. This is Holler's view of Windsor Castle, um, bird's eye view. But uh, here you can see, come back in, the, uh, the, the, the rooms, uh, the, the ranges that were constructed by uh, Edward III, which uh, were gathered around two uh, courtyards, uh, well, one here and one here. This is the kitchen court down here. This is the elevation you were looking at before. And... Um, uh, the, these uh, these great rooms here um, contain uh, uh, these great ranges here contain the, the the rooms of state, and these were rooms which uh, the likes of which really hadn't been um, seen before um, in this uh, uh, country. And uh, by the time Edward III uh, died in 1377, uh, Windsor Castle was unquestionably the largest, the most luxurious, the most modern residence, not only royal residence, but uh, residence of, of any type um, in the kingdom. And these works at Windsor, I think, were completely and utterly uh, consuming. And it's not really very surprising that during Edward III's reign, Windsor was very much the centre of royal gravity. And I'll go on in, in a minute just to talk a little bit uh, about that. But in the um, second year of Richard II's reign, and here is that famous uh, portrait of Richard II at, at Westminster Abbey, came a reform that was to shift focus away from Windsor to uh, Westminster and was to establish for the first time a permanent department to organise royal building. This was the office of the King's Works, uh, a body that was founded in 1378 and was placed under a clerk who was in charge of organising the construction and the maintenance of the royal estate, and a controller, as in comptroller, who was responsible for financing it. And although um, uh, the headquarters of the clerk, who's the man in charge of it all, was in Westminster, he had extensive responsibilities right the way across England, where the king's houses were. And so he appointed a, a gang of regional assistants, if you like, who were known as purveyors. And it was their job, the purveyor's job, to recruit uh, craftsmen um, and uh, organise the materials locally to repair the um, king's um, uh, houses. The clerk uh, and the controller were actually salaried officials, and uh, as so often with senior salaried officials in the medieval royal household, they not only received money, they received a livery. That was um, a, a grand cloak uh, a, a, um, with a, a, a fur collar, which signified um, their um, status. 
Uh, before the Reformation, uh, many, not all, of the clerks of the king's works were in holy orders. And uh, most famously, one wasn't, and this is Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, one of the laymen uh, who occupied the position uh, between 1489 uh, to uh, 1491. And showing you a picture of Chaucer just emphasizes the fact uh, that these clerks were not architects. They were not builders. They were priests. They were, in this case, a, a, oh, he's gone again, a poet. Um, they were administrators. They were administrators who handled very substantial sums of money, uh, sometimes drawn from um, other departments, um, but usually then moving on through the Office of Works to undertake more important jobs in the uh, royal service. Their office was uh, in the Palace of Westminster. Uh, we'll talk about some more. This is Westminster Great Hall. Um, this is roughly where Big Ben is now. Uh, you'll be familiar with, with, with the Great Hall. This, uh, as you walk down um, through Parliament Square, there's a, a statue of Oliver Cromwell just there, yeah? And just at that point there, where Oliver Cromwell's statue was, was the office of the clerk of the King's Works. It was from that area there, that little patch of green now that's, that's um, outside Westminster Hall, which was the location from which all the King's uh, building uh, activities were organised through the 14th, 15th, um, and into the beginning of the 16th um, century. So if the uh, clerk... Uh, was not a builder or an architect, and if the controller was basically an accountant, where did the design skills come from? Well, working very closely with these two administrative uh, chiefs were a number of official royal craftsmen. There was a master craftsman, uh, a master mason, a master plumber, uh, a master glazier, and a master blacksmith. And it was these men who possessed the technical skills in design, in engineering, and in construction that I suppose today we would call um, architectural. And these master craftsmen were responsible for taking the brief that was set by the king, or potentially by one of his uh, senior um, officers, translating that into drawings in the drawing office that was re re relocated re here. They had drawing offices with big um, drawing boards in them. And sometimes they would have uh, turned these instructions into a little, a little model for royal approval. These uh, master craftsmen were experts in uh, geometry, and they'd learnt uh, the principles of construction and engineering basically from first-hand experience, from a long apprenticeship actually building things with um, older um, men. They worked as a team, the masons designing the walls, the carpenters designing the roofs, the doors and the panelling, the glaziers designing the windows, the plumbers designing the, the, the lead work uh, in, on the roofs, etc., uh, etc. Et of course, they conferred. They, um, they had to, otherwise the building would just fall down. Um, but uh, the important point is that each of them reigned completely supreme over the area of their craft. In fact, it was usually known as their mystery, the, the area of their mystery. So these master masons and carpenters, um, the people who designed their houses uh, in, in the Middle Ages, were men of high ability, um, of high reputation. And uh, like the uh, controller and like the clerk of the king's works, they too uh, had the right to wear um, a livery. The master smith was a little bit unusual because his primary job was to make weapons. And he had... Uh, a very large and complicated setup um, in the Tower of London, um, but as well as f furnishing all the equipage that was needed to go to war, um, he um, also furnished the needs of the king's uh, uh, houses too. And together with his colleagues, the um, plumber, the glazier, and later on um, a master painter was added to the Office of Works. Uh, all of them had these um, liveries and they had the status of squires in the um, king's household. So these weren't menial people at all. These were people who um, had uh, status and authority. Now, this is a very important moment, the establishment of the king's uh, office of works. And it would be nice, I suppose, to imagine that the establishment of this, the first official architectural and construction department in England, was due to some 
desire to improve the quality of design or the quality of, dis of construction in some way. But uh, I'm afraid to say it wasn't. This was a piece of bureaucratic um, engineering. It was basically a, a seen as a way of more efficiently um, organising the royal um, estate. And we should note, note that uh, not all the domestic residences of the king were um, included um, in uh, this, uh, under the responsibility of the Office of Works. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the houses occupied by his wives, the queens and um, his sons, uh, sat outside the responsibility of the Office of Works and therefore sat outside the uh, accounting mechanisms which produce the records that tell us about these buildings. And so as a consequence, although we know quite a lot, and I'll talk quite a lot this evening, about what we know about the places in which the king lived, we know very little about the houses which the queen owned, and um, uh, frequently very uh, uh, little uh, about what uh, the houses of which his um, family lived in. But the Office of Works, founded in the early years of Richard II's reign, was a body that continued for the next 400 years. And it, in fact, became the most important body of building professionals uh, in English architecture. And this is, I think, an extremely important point, because we in England, unlike, for instance, in France, had no Royal Architectural Academy. There was no uh, um, um, state-sponsored school of architecture, and before the late 19th century, no independent um, formal training organized for um, architects. And as a result, the Office of Works, founded in the early years of Richard II's reign, became essentially the school in which almost every single one of our greatest uh, architects um, were uh, trained. And by extension, and this is a, another very important point, this means that the construction and the maintenance of the royal estate, um, and I suppose to a degree the estate of the army and the, uh, and the navy, were the practical forcing grounds for English architectural and technological innovation. The place to be, if you wanted to get on in architecture, was in the Office of Works. And that was the case, really, from the reign of uh, Richard II uh, well into the um, reign of uh, Queen Victoria. So let's now move on from the bureaucratic bit, which is very important to understand, to consider what was actually being built uh, by uh, monarchs uh, in the years between um, Richard II and Richard III. It always sounds as if that's a very short period, but of course it isn't, because that is the period between the death of Edward III in 1377 and the defeat of Richard III at Bosworth Field in 1485. Well, thanks to the establishment of the Office of Works, we know precisely how much, to the last penny, was spent by monarchs through the Office of Works on their domestic residences in that period. And uh, for your interest, it was just under £64,000. Um, but in that period, there was really only major building work in two uh, principal uh, royal palaces. Because in the period after Edward III's death, up to the um, accession of um, Henry VII, monarchs bought houses, they sold them, they uh, swapped them, they exchanged them, they confiscated them, and there was really a great ebb and flow of residences that were used by the crown. In fact, only seven residences remained in constant royal ownership and use in the whole of that long period from Edward III to um, Henry VII. So these were they, the seven were these. Uh, in London and the Thames Valley, you obviously had Westminster, which we've um, got on the screen there. The Tower of London, which had uh, residential parts in it and was used um, quite regularly as a royal residence, uh, and Windsor Castle. So Westminster, the Tower of London, Windsor Castle. Uh, in the west, we had Clarendon, which I talked about uh, last time, and Woodstock, uh, which is on the, uh, in, in, on the site of where uh, Blenheim Palace is now. 
um, a, a hunting lodge, a very large hunting lodge, uh, a house in Essex at Havering, at Havering at Bower, and uh, in Nottinghamshire, um, a, uh, a, another hunting seat at a place called Clipston. And uh, these seven were really the seven places that remained constant. Many other places uh, were owned for uh, brief periods, some maybe for 80, 90 years, but still relatively brief periods. Um, but the, the fact is, is that the core of royal residences was basically shrinking. There were fewer royal houses. Now, why was this? Why were the number of houses that the monarchs owned actually reducing? Well, I think there are four reasons for it. The first one really starts in the reign of Edward III um, himself, because from around 1370, uh, Edward III becomes much more sedentary. The relentless moving around between his dozens of houses uh, slows down. He becomes older, he becomes gradually actually more senile, and he more or less holds up at Windsor Castle and at uh, Windsor Manor, which is a, a building which I'll talk about in a moment, which was in uh, Windsor Pass Park next door. He very rarely went to Westminster. He very rarely went to the Tower um, of London. And what this had the effect of was centralising government and administration here at uh, Westminster. Uh, the king was not taking it all around the country with him. In those last years of his reign, uh, almost all the departments of, of state and um, absolutely all the departments of um, the household began to have permanent headquarters at uh, Westminster. And I've described already how the um, Office of Works very, very quickly um, uh, established its headquarters at Westminster. So the first reason for reduction in houses is that uh, the king's, Edward III stops moving around um, and there, um, there's a concentration of, of, of um, official uh, uh, um, functions at Westminster. The second point is that actually, when you look at it, during the 14th and 15th century, the monarchy is actually not very rich. And it's not very rich in comparison with what uh, the monarchy enjoyed in the 12th and 13th century, and it certainly wasn't rich compared to what the monarchy enjoyed in the 16th century. This was partially due, uh, and this is a little bit of a circular argument, to the fact that there were fewer royal houses, and therefore that a smaller uh, proportion of royal income came from agricultural rents and from, from royal estates. A greater proportion of income came from taxation, and this basically made English kings poorer than they had been. So the simple fact was, that these monarchs um, uh, in the, the, the 14th and 15th century uh, were reliant on taxation and had less money to spend on, on houses and so had fewer houses. The third uh, uh, reason for this shrinking in numbers of houses was that monarchs, as we will hear in a few moments, increasingly expected to be comfortable. Now, I know this sounds totally unreasonable, but uh, they were no longer prepared to just doss down overnight in a castle that hadn't been used for sort of five or six years, which had been quickly tarted up so that they could stay in it for a few nights. They, they just didn't want to do that. They expected warm rooms. They expected rooms which were, were properly furnished with tapestries, with proper cooking facilities and washing facilities. And this standard of luxury could only be provided at a smaller number of residences. You couldn't just do that in all these dozens of castles and things that were all over the country. And the last point, um, now there's something very bad happening to this laptop um, here, which says, my battery power is low, open brackets, 7%. If you don't plug in your computer soon, it will hibernate automatically. <laughs> Thank you, I see someone coming to rescue me. Excellent, thank you very much. So, we're on the fourth reason, um, and the fourth reason is that um, the royal household was getting bigger. The number of people who uh, surrounded the king was getting bigger all the time. So, if we go back to Henry I, you know, in the, in the sort of, uh, still effectively the Norman period, the royal household was about 150 people. Um, under Edward I, it had grown to about 600 people. And by the time we get to Richard II's reign, where we're starting this evening, you're looking at about 700 people um, being uh, in the king's um, household. And of course, what 
what this uh, meant that uh, it was relatively easy for um, Henry I to gallop around the country amidst dozens and dozens of houses with 150 people. When you're moving 700 around, you actually are not quite so keen to carry on moving between all these places. So, for all these four reasons, what we um, start to see is a reduction. Okay, and when the picture comes up again, ah, you will see what, what happens. You see that there is, um, um, there is a, there's basically um, an, in, in increase, a, a, an increasing uh, um, densification of houses in the Thames Valley. Anyway, that was a map showing how the number of houses reduced and, uh, and, and concentrated uh, around the, um, the Thames Valley. Uh, and what this um, concentration, increasing concentration in, of, of houses in the Thames Valley uh, uh, did was coincide with some major changes in the royal court. This actually, I've just used the, the term, the word court, and this is the first time I've used the word court. Uh, in my last lecture, I didn't use it at all. Um, and so I think we do just need to ask a question here. I mean, w what is a court? And when does a, a court first appear? Because, of course, it's a very, very important point about uh, uh, how royal palaces are used. And, of course, this all depends on what we mean uh, in terms of the definition of the word. But historians in the past have argued quite strongly that the court, as we would sort of understand it today, was essentially an invention of the Tudors, introduced by uh, Henry VII and then perfected by um, Henry VIII. But I think we no longer really um, believe this. And I think that uh, today, most historians, and I would say, that a court as a sort of recognizable concept was born in the period that we are considering uh, tonight. Now, let's just be clear to begin with about what we're talking about, because there's a difference between the household and the court. The household is quite an easy thing to define. The household was the structured organization that sustained the everyday life of the king and therefore um, his everyday um, rule. And it contained all the functions necessary for everyday uh, life. Um, so it would contain uh, the kitchens, the people who moved your carts around, the horses, uh, the wardrobe. All those things were your household. The court is a much more amorphous uh, concept because the court had no uh, static membership. Um, it contained all the people who were at that time welcomed by the sovereign as participants in his daily round of life. These might be his friends. They were certainly his supporters. But crucially, they weren't functionaries sorting out everyday life. They were part of the setting of kingship. They were ornaments to the king's power. And so uh, there's a sense in which uh, the court provides the spectacle around uh, the monarch, while the household was the machinery that made that spectacle possible. I hope you get that distinction between what I'm saying. And so a crucial um, component in the nature um, of a court is courtliness, is courtliness. Courtliness as in some refinement of manners, and some refinement in behaviour to which the members of the court actually subscribe. And it only became possible for courtliness to flourish when the king's closest attendants ceased to be soldiers who were geared for military action. Because it's at this point that it becomes possible to enjoy a greater interest in the arts, I mean, tapestry and painting and poetry and sculpture and music. And crucially, it became, becomes possible to admit more women into your um, everyday life. When you're dealing with a war band, there are no women there. When you have a court, it is full of women and men. And this is the change, the magic change, that uh, begins to happen in the period that we are talking um, about tonight. It is perhaps possible to discern, as early as the reign of Henry III, some of these things happening. But 
these things become marked and remarked upon in the reign of Richard II. And I showed you um, at the beginning that great portrait of him in Westminster, of him sitting on a throne with his crown on it. And I, I think that it's that moment when you see Richard II stamping his sort of kingly image um, on the, uh, his kingdom in, in that painting when you can pinpoint the uh, birth of a court in a sort of modern um, sense. Now, uh, Richard III's court uh, was one that expressed an interest in culture. Uh, it comprised uh, women to a much greater degree than previously. Uh, it portrayed itself magnificently, and it introduced a greater degree of uh, status and deference and hierarchy. I mean, it was... Uh, Edward III, at the end of his reign, who started involve, uh, inventing new types of aristocracy. So Edward III inv in invented the rank of a duke. But uh, Richard II in in invents all sorts of other ranks. He for instance, he invents the rank of Marquis. So he's introducing hierarchy amongst his uh, soldiers. And, and at this point, I would want to show you the Wil Wilton diptych, which you all know in the, in the National Gallery, that wonderful personal... Uh, a diptych that must have sat on one of Richard II's altars. Now just half close your eyes and imagine it in the back of your mind. Um, on the back of it is the white heart with a, a crown around his neck, uh, um, Richard II's personal emblem. On the other reverse side of the panel is his coat of arms, you know, es you know, establishing his, his rank and uh, his lineage. And on uh, on the front of it is that the wonderful presentation of the kneeling king in profile, absolutely beautiful, uh, his presentation to um, John the Baptist with um, the two previous royal kings who had been canonized, canonized English, English kings had been canonized, uh, Edward the Confessor and St. Edmund. But the great thing about the Wilton Diptych is you know, we, we, we don't have, as, uh, we have one interior um, of uh, Richard II's reign. But what the Wilton Diptych gives us is it gives us that sense of the, um, the richness, the luxury, the sophistication, and something of the mentality um, of this extremely um, in, in, in interesting um, uh, king. And so Richard um, portrayed in the, uh, in, in the Westminster uh, uh, retable, uh, wearing his crown. We know he did this. We've got... Uh, we've got uh, descriptions of him presiding over banquets, wearing his crown, not speaking to anybody, just looking kingly and important and, uh, uh, and imperious, um, presiding over this, um, this uh, court. He loved rich clothes, very, very interested in, in his um, personal attire, um, priceless personal jewellery. There's an extraordinary inventory that catalogues the, the extraordinary jewels that he had. Um, he loved rich food, um, and he loved having himself painted. He was a very vain man. He was very tall. He had great, long, flowing, um, uh, fair um, hair. What I've just been describing to you and what I would have been showing you on the Wilton diptych is a fundamentally different environment from that which would have, for instance, surrounded King Edward I only 70 years before. Because Edward I's household was um, a business-like household full of military men and full of administrators. Um, it was those people, it was the, 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 the military who had the greatest uh, status. It was his 50 household knights, his royal bodyguard, in effect a sort of elite private army. These were the people who surrounded the king. They weren't courtiers, they were soldiers. And their friendship and their loyalty had been forged on the battlefield, had been forged in blood, and it was these knights that set an incredibly militaristic uh, tone of the king's um, uh, entourage. And everyone below the military knights um, in these earlier households, uh, from the pages to the grooms to the cooks and the tailors, they all had a military role to play. So whenever the king went to, uh, uh, went to war, the entire uh, household um, clicked into their, their military um, uh, uh, um, role. Um, 
So just for a moment, uh, uh, um, reflecting on the nature of Edward I's household, I think helps throw into, um, in, into sharp focus um, how different Richard III's household was. But I don't want you to think that uh, in somehow the English royal household changed in this sort of very dramatic way um, when other uh, royal households el elsewhere across Europe were not, because there was um, a sort of movement across Europe a movement in house, royal households across Europe to create a more ceremonious way of life. And this was perhaps in reaction to the waves of violent unrest that swept across Europe in the years um, after the Black Death, and of course which were characterised in this country by the um, Peasants' Revolt of 1381. I think somehow rulers felt that they needed to distance themselves from the ordinary people, these troublesome, uh, rebellious subjects. And the way they distanced distance themselves were by creating these um, courts with incredibly rarefied clothes and fashions and tastes, which really set them um, uh, uh, apart from um, the people themselves. I'm now beginning to run out of things I can say without some slides. Um, so. This change I'm just describing, this, this creation of a court, had very substantial architectural consequences. Um, and we began to see the, 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 the foundations of this uh, in the reign of Edward III um, at uh, Windsor Castle. And I think that the, um, the extraordinary uh, building, which I started off with this evening, and thank goodness I showed you a picture of it before everything went horribly wrong, um, is... Uh, you know, was an expression in many ways of this more ceremonious life that kings were living. Um, and those, the, the great rooms which were, 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 were set up in Windsor were the, um, the theatre set, if you like, for this more ceremonious uh, way of um, going on. So just, just, I just want to talk about Wind, Wind, Windsor for a second, because um, Windsor, uh, Edward III's conception uh, for Windsor wasn't just a, a great castle. Um, even if you go to Windsor now, you're very aware of the way it's set in Windsor Great Park. And in the Middle Ages, um, the park was just one part of Windsor Forest, which was an extraordinarily large um, area of royal-owned land that covered a very large part of uh, Berkshire and, 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 and some of Surrey and even some of, of Middlesex, in fact. And uh, Windsor Castle itself was um, surrounded by a series of satellite houses, smaller houses which allowed um, Edward III to retreat from the splendour of his royal lodgings uh, in the castle itself and live a more um, uh, private sort of life um, in, the, in Windsor Manor, um, in East Hampstead House, in Follijon House, um, in Henley-on-the-Heath, in Witchmere um, uh, also. So these uh, five uh, buildings in the Windsor Forest were the places where um, the king could, uh, could, could retreat to. This is the plan which actually didn't come out very well last time and I was determined to show it to you uh, uh, again very quickly. Um, so this is the Great Hall, here's the chapel um, and the king's apartments here, um, a great chamber, um, private rooms in a little, little tower, a presence chamber, a vast bed chamber here with views over the Thames Valley, some private rooms, the queen's rooms across here. You only need all this stuff when you have got a court that has got ceremony going behind it. And this is really the point that I'm, um, uh, I'm making. And quickly, before we lose this, um, let's whack on through these. Um, here's the Wilton Diptych. So um, here is John the Baptist. Here are the two um, English sainted kings. And here is Richard kneeling, um, being uh, obviously presented here. Um, <clears throat> and quickly on the back, this is the, the, his, his personal um, album, uh, emblem here uh, and the coats of arms. So this is the, the, the richness I'm, uh, I've been talking about. Here he is encrusted in jewels, in cloth of gold, with his, wearing his crown. Um, uh, so this is the, 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 the court we're talking about. And we're just about to get now to the two maps of Windsor, uh, where we will um, see that... Uh, here we are. So here's Windsor Castle. This is Windsor Forest. Huge amount of land, all owned by the king. And these things with the sort of um, circles around them are the houses I was talking about. Here is a um, Norden's map of 17th century. Here they are again. Can you see them? 
Uh, so these are the subsidiary houses that um, Edward III um, and uh, his uh, um, successors were able to retreat into when they didn't want to stay up um, in the castle um, here. And this is important because the, uh, the, the, the management of these houses was taken out of the hands of the Office of Works and was put into the hands of the king's chamber, the, the personal finances of the king. And this is the first distinction that we get, again, in uh, royal history, the distinction that we're very familiar with today between the state residences of the monarch and the private ones. This is the distinction between Sandringham and Balmoral, the personal property of the Queen, and Windsor and Buckingham Palace, um, the things of the Queen's in the right of crown. And the distinction that is made in the Middle Ages is the, is the ones that, 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 that the residences that are managed by the Office of Works, which I talked about, and the, the, the residences that are, that are run by the King's Chamber. And I'll come on to talk about this um, in just a moment, because I, because I think it is uh, very um, important. Now, I said at the beginning that um, uh, there were very few buildings that were actually built um, in this period we're talking about this evening. And, you know, it's quite a troublesome period. In my title, I talk about the Wars of the Roses, which is shorthand for the uh, the, the disruption that this country uh, uh, um, suffered in, in, in the, fifth, the 15th century. So um, Richard II, we'll talk about his buildings in, in a moment, but Henry IV had terrible financial problems. Henry V spent most of his time duffing up the French. He did that very well. Um, Henry VI um, commissioned lots of things but finished very few. Um, and Ed, under Edward IV, um, a few bits and pieces um, were built. But uh, Richard II, of course, is, is principally famous for the extraordinary building works um, at Westminster. It um, <clears throat> was he who took the great hall that had been constructed by um, Henry III. I mean, Henry III had made this the great throne room of England um, and transformed it into a setting for this glittering court I had, uh, uh, have described. Um, and what you um, see um, here is the result of Richard's decision in 1393 to rebuild West Westminster Hall, a project that was completed in 1401. Uh, the massive walls of the Norman period were retained, and this huge uh, roof uh, was uh, uh, put on the largest piece of carpentry in Western Europe. Uh, everyone here will be familiar with the fact that it is um, a, a hammer beam roof, uh, a, a way of spanning a, a much, much larger uh, uh, span than could otherwise be um, covered with uh, roof trusses and, of course, much more magnificent as well, uh, uh, designed by the King's master carpenter, um, Hugh Herland. Um, and um, uh, at the end of each of these uh, hammer beams, and it's just about to come here, uh, you see it here, was an angel um, holding uh, the, uh, the, the royal um, uh, badge, uh, the royal arms um, of England. And so this roof was a representation of the heavens spread out over the earthly court of Richard II. And take your mind back to the Wilton Diptych, and you can see a theme um, uh, uh, growing here, which I will elaborate, because um, behind the, the, the king's throne, um, which would have been at the dais end here, ignore these steps for the time being, can you see there are one, two, three, there are six niches there um, on the back wall of Westminster Hall installed by Richard the, the, the II. And these um, niches, uh, here, here, there you are, you see the rest of them behind his uh, throne, were a bit like a pulpitum in uh, a cathedral. This is, this is York, York Minster. Um, the, the, the background, um, uh, again, was sort of religious iconography. And when we look at the, the entrance facade of Westminster Hall, this is his new facade he put on with these big uh, 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 um, towers. Again, here can you see this uh, uh, range of, um, uh, of niches containing statues, very, very much like, this is Ex that was briefly Exeter Cathedral, um, uh, very much like um, a cathedral. And so what uh, Richard is, is, is creating here um, at Westminster um, is uh, uh, a building which deliberately uses um, the power of uh, religious association to elevate um, his uh, court. 
And this incredibly important commission, I think, illustrates perfectly what I've been saying about the nature of his rule and the elevation of his kingly office above being simply the uh, leader of a uh, war band. Now, I think you can also see this um, in some of the um, other buildings that we know he built. And one of the places that uh, both um, Edward III and Richard II were very keen on was um, the palace at Sheen, um, now Richmond uh, upon Thames. Um, and the manor of Sheen uh, had come into royal possession in the early 14th century. And um, Edward III decided he'd build a, a house there. Um, and uh, Richard uh, decided that he would um, uh, embellish that house further. And um, unfortunately, we can only really get to understand anything about it through the building accounts of the Office of Works. But we know that um, the place was probably moated. It was entered over a bridge with a great gatehouse. There was a hall and a chapel, as you'd expect, various chambers for the king and queen, lots of lodgings for the court, and then there were the normal um, buildings, uh, kitchens, stables, um, and, uh, and the like. Um, Edward III spent a lot of time uh, there in his old age. In fact, he died there in 1377. Um, and Richard II made some additions, which I think, again, help illustrate this change that happened uh, in his reign. And the thing that I'm most interested in is he built a luxurious little sort of love nest for himself, on an island in the middle of the Thames in front of uh, the, the palace. Um, this place had several rooms, uh, heated by fireplaces, had its own kitchen. He had a new barge made for himself so that he could be rowed across from the mainland to this island. A, a, a landing stage was made there to help him get there in comfort. Um, and he made a bathroom um, lined with um, tiles. Um, and I think these glimpses of this Rather, what must have been rather an extraordinary little sort of luxurious hideaway in the middle of the Thames, uh, help us understand what happened next. Because when his wife, Anne of Bohemia, um, died, Richard, in a fit of grief, maybe a sort of partially a fit of lunacy also, ordered the whole place to be knocked down, everything. The, the island, which is called the Night, was knocked down. The house was knocked down. The site was um, completely razed. So we have no chance of visualising what this was like. But what we can do is we can go to Kenilworth Castle today. This is the castle that survives now. The mere is now, unfortunately, grazed by cattle. But you can see where the mere was. This is a great lake. Uh, but uh, on the other side of the, the mere was this, which was a little um, retreat. Uh, only, you only got to by water from the castle, and this must have been very, very similar to the retreat that Richard um, II uh, made at um, Sheen. Um, this one um, uh, is almost exactly um, contemporary, a royal one, because um, uh, John of Gaunt uh, owned the castle. This is, this is actually constructed by um, Henry V, but um, is exactly the same idea. So this, this sense of luxury and this sense of privacy that starts to be um, important for these um, monarchs. Now, there was a second palace uh, built at Sheen after uh, Richard II's um, death. And this was actually uh, built on the site of the demolished building and begun by Henry V in 1414 and was continued um, until his um, death in 1414. 22, and it was then finished by um, Henry VI. And uh, it's gone, but we do know what it looked like. And this uh, is a painting of Henry V's uh, uh, palace. It was burnt out under Henry VII, and these turrets and twiddles on the top were added. But the basic um, uh, um, structure of what you see here is the palace built by Henry V at um, Sheen. And you can see it here in a 16th century drawing uh, by um, Vingarda. And uh, in just one moment, when it returns to the land of the living, uh, you will see um, the way that the it was a very complicated plan with um, lots of windows looking out, lots of bays and bows uh, and battlements. Um, and uh, we have managed to get a plan of it. And you can see here, look how incredibly complicated this plan is here, uh, with the courtyard um, in the centre. 
at in visualizing what this uh, place was uh, actually like. Um, you could go to um, this uh, castle here. Uh, is it Walkworth um, in Northumberland? Um, here, here we are, um, which is built uh, a little bit before um, Henry V uh, builds Sheen, but uh, is stone, um, as uh, was um, the, the, the buildings of Sheen, and was built on this very sort of complicated uh, plan. You see here the plan. You can see how complicated it is. And you can see um, inside here how the, uh, how the rooms are incredibly ingeniously um, uh, 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 actually um, laid out. Um, so this uh, uh, building at Walkworth, I think, was a, a, a very similar uh, retreat uh, to the one that was uh, created uh, by um, Henry V uh, at, at Sheen. The man uh, who was in charge of uh, building Sheen was the king's master mason, Stephen Lott, and I think Sheen was his masterpiece. Uh, his, we have his will. When he died in 1418, we learned that he had rooms um, actually in Sheen, in the royal palace, um, and in those rooms, we know from his will, he kept uh, a chest which contained all the detailed drawings that had been used to build this extraordinary um, uh, to build this extraordinary uh, palace, which we're just going to have on the screen again in, in a second here. And um, interestingly, he bequeathed uh, those drawings to his fellow mason, uh, Thomas Mappleton, who was uh, the person who was to succeed him. And I think that um, this you know, sort of gives us an insight into the sort of the architectural genius that uh, that that created this place. But the level of personal interest um, shown by Henry V, who we normally associated being a very sort of militaristic king, uh, in building this uh, palace is indicated by something else. Between 1414 and 1419, the king spent 8,000 pounds on building Sheen, um, and another 2,000 pounds on building two uh, religious houses next door to it. And you can see the remains of one of these um, uh, religious houses on this side here um, that, uh, that was built by Henry at the um, same time. Um, so that was £8,000 on the house and £2,000 on the, on the religious houses. £7,363 of that expenditure came from the king's personal fund, the chamber, and did not come from the Office of Works. And what this means, as I explained earlier, is that the king, Henry V, was controlling personally the expenditure in building this um, uh, a, a beautiful uh, a building. And uh, I would uh, 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 use this as another piece of evidence to show the change in the nature um, of uh, the interest of monarchs in what they were building and uh, the way they were living. So, while the period that we've been looking at this evening is not notable for a large number of important buildings, it is, I think, very important for these fundamental changes that took place in the nature of the royal household. And primarily, uh, we can see the development of what we can recognize as a court, and with it, an elevation of the personal status of the king. And in this, an architectural aggrandizement of royal buildings. We see this at Westminster Hall. Uh, we see this in the personal, uh, personal luxury that was uh, created um, at Sheen um, and, and also um, at um, Kenilworth. Now, um, it wouldn't take very long this evening to jump on a train from Thameslink and uh, nip down to Eltham. Uh, Eltham uh, was a palace that was enjoyed by both Edward III and Richard II, although uh, if you go there today, you won't see a, a great deal of their work. What does survive, however, is the most important remaining architectural work of the Lancastrian kings, which you see on the screen here, which is the Eltham Palace Great Hall. This was built uh, in the 1460s, and you can see here um, how um, Edward IV takes a direct quotation from, the, uh, from Westminster Hall, building a roof that is, I mean, really inc incredibly um, similar, obviously nothing like as big. Um, but this uh, building, 
I think really um, uh, is the building in which we can see, uh, the surviving building, which we can see for the first time, the fusion of the monumental public magnificence of monarchy with an increasing emphasis on the private and personal space occupied by the king. And as we will um, find out in my um, lecture uh, next week, this is the uh, next time, this is the uh, great theme that was developed under Henry VII uh, and Henry VIII, the ability to create intense personal magnificence with intense private uh, pleasure. Thank you very much.